Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you're in the, uh, welcome to the session of the Integrated Approach to Kidney Disease. Uh, the session speaker today is uh, Dr. Richard Snyder. Dr. Snyder is uh, board certified in both internal medicine and nephrology. He's the author of What You Must Know About Kidney Disease, a practical guide to using conventional and complementary treatments. He's also the host of Improve Your Kidney Health, the weekly talk show on the Voice of America Health and Wellness Channel. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Snyder. Thank you, man. Very cool. Um, I, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank your, your, your Bob, your dad, your Bob is a great guy. I just want to say that in public. And this is a great hotel. And if you haven't seen the Ducks, you have to see the Ducks. That's just as fantastic. Um, some of you, when I had the privilege of meeting you earlier today, uh, was asking me, what do I mean by an integrated approach and what does that involve? So before we even kind of get started with, with the lecture, and I promise you we don't have 60 slides, but I, I want to give a little bit of a different way about thinking about kidney disease. I, I just want to start with a couple of concrete examples so that you can understand where I'm coming from with this. About two and a half years ago, and that's when uh, I really started getting involved in integrative care, meaning not just using traditional medicines, but also alt alternative and complementary therapies. And I think that an integrated approach is the best approach, and we'll talk about that. But a woman came in, she was a young woman in her mid-40s, and she came in, and she sat down, and she held her purse like this. And she glared at me, even as I just walked in. Now, I had taken a shower. I wasn't sure why she was upset. I mean, I used deodorant. Everything was pretty good. And I sat down. I said, hello, my name is Dr. Snyder. Please call me Rich. And, and, and it was just everything was a one-word answer. And I finally said to her, I said, are you okay? You know, you're very, you seem very upset. I just had the privilege of meeting you. Was there something? That, and, she, and she screamed at me, I don't want to be on prednisone. And I said, Sure, I mean, we'll talk about things. She goes, the last three doctors I've been through, they all want to put me on prednisone. You know, my sister was on prednisone, and she got diabetes and cataracts and, and osteoporosis, and I don't want that. So if you're going to tell me that I need to be on prednisone, I'm leaving. So needless to say, it, you know, it started that, you know, opening my eyes to other ways and, you know, that there's a million ways to skin a cat, and that maybe there's different ways of thinking about things. So we'll talk about, you know, during this lecture, some of the approaches that we used uh, and, and my practice is more of a specialty practice, and you know, through word of mouth, I see a lot more people who say to me, I don't want to be treated with regular medication, or is there something that I can use naturally? If we're talking about high blood pressure, I most recently saw a lady, and this was about, about six weeks ago, and her blood pressure, she came in, she was very tired, and her primary doctor had said she had a history of, t said she was depressed and wanted to put her on Prozac. And when I looked at she says, but I tried to tell him it all started when I started on this one medication. Now, she was on a medicine, a beta blocker. And again, not bad for blood pressure, but it's not without side effects. And, and everyone is different in terms of how they tolerate medications. And the first thing we did was lower down her beta blocker, but we needed to do a couple other things. And she had a laundry list of medications that she had a bad reaction to. Clonidine made her tired. ACE inhibitors made her cough. You know, if she took uh, Norvask, it, it made her swelling. She had swelling like this or she was constipated. You know, and these are side effects that many of us who are on these medications may have dealt with. So, you know, her kidney function was normal. I noticed that her magnesium level, if the normal level should be like 1.6 to 2, hers was 1.6. But again, that reference range, you know, I, I got her magnesium level up to 2.2. Two, and I put her on something called olive leaf extract which is an antifungal, but also a great anti-blood uh, pressure medication. Her blood pressure has been in the 130s. She feels fantastic. And she came in, uh, and again, if just to reveal the personal aspect of this, she says, I feel the better than I have in years. She fortunately has taken care of her husband who's just diagnosed with prostate cancer. So sometimes just by changing what we're dealing with and what we're looking at, you know, we can do something for ourselves and, and do something for our kidneys that maybe it's just about thinking outside the box. And it was that foray, especially with that lady with prednisone two and a half years ago, that got me you know, indoctrinated into the whole world of integrative kidney care. 
There's two things that if you take nothing away from this hour that I want to leave you with. One is that kidney disease is a state of inflammation. And if you can lower this state of inflammation, you can prevent the worsening of kidney disease. And the second thing is we can't think of kidney disease in and of itself. We have to think about the other organs that, that they're associated with, right? What is the most common reason that those with kidney disease, you know, the morbidity and mortality is not from kidneys, it's from heart disease, right? So there's a special heart-kidney connection. There's also a liver-kidney connection as well. You know, one out of every three people is obese. I'm not a skinny man. I don't claim to be. I've, tr I've been trying, and I know how hard it is to diet and, and to lose weight. And again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir when I say I know how hard it is, but and it took some necessary steps. But fatty liver has become one of the most common causes or the most common cause of liver disease in the United States. It's bypassed hepatitis C. It's bypassed alcohol. What does that have to do with the kidney? Well, when you change your liver, you know, when, when you have cirrhosis or you have liver disease, it changes the way the kidneys react to the liver. It makes it more susceptible to chronic kidney disease. There's also a special, you know, we've heard about everyone taking probiotics, and there's a special connection between intestines and kidney disease. So this, you know, the two big points of this lecture is understanding that kidney disease is a state of inflammation, and I'm going to talk about this next, as well as understanding the relationship that the kidneys have with the different organs of the body. If you were to go on Medscape.com, Medscape, uh, M-E-D-S-C-A-P-E.com is a reference that doctors use. It's also somewhat something that anyone can sign up for. One of the top ten most looked at articles, this is too loud, I'll, I tend to have a big mouth, so I apologize. Um, one of the top ten research articles of the past year, year and a half, concerned a, sub, a medicine called bardoxolone. And this is a novel anti-inflammatory that improved glomerular filtration rate, which is when we have kidney disease, we don't want to know just what the creatinine is. We want to know how well is our kidneys working as a filter. And that there were some preliminary studies that it showed it improved GFR and CKD. One of the investigators had said, quote, the drug has been shown in shorter studies to increase estimated GFR, to decrease blood urea and nitrogen, serum phosphorus, and serum uric acid, and to increase creatinine clearance. Well, this is all great. This is what we would want in a medication. But there were significant side effects, cramps and hypomagnesemia were frequent adverse effects. Their mechanisms are not clear and should be evaluated. And given that low magnesium concentrations are associated with cardiac arrhythmias and sudden death is common in chronic kidney disease, it's not a trivial side effect. So we have this medication that may lower GFR and improve CKD and, and they're undergoing phase two and phase three clinical trials, but if you take it, you could get an arrhythmia, die, and you could have electrolyte abnormalities. So does it pay to rock Peter to pay Paul? But what if I said to you, there are natural ways you could lower inflammation? So the reason that this was so important is because it said, how did we improve GFR? We lowered the inflammatory state. One of the things that this study really pointed out was chronic kidney disease is a state of inflammation whether it's stage one, stage two, stage three, it's a state of inflammation that if we do things to reduce the level of inflammation, we can help preserve and maybe improve our kidney function. The second thing is that conditions that cause chronic kidney disease are also inflammatory conditions. Think about it this way. The cell is the basic unit of life, okay? Hypertension and diabetes at the level of the cell are inflammatory conditions. Diabetes, the, the way that it causes problems in the kidney is it increases the workload of the kidney, but how? High blood sugars, protein in the urine increases the inflammatory response. There is a substance that's called transforming growth factor beta. TGF beta is one of those substances that in any kind or any uh, cause of chronic kidney disease is upregulated. Diabetes increases this expression of this, what they call cytokine, a pro-inflammatory protein, big time. What this protein does, it, it, it causes the formation of collagen, which is scarring. So if this protein is upregulated over time, 
you have more scarring, you have irreversibility and worsening chronic kidney disease. It's a driver of inflammation. High blood pressure at the level of a cell, angiotensin II, uric acid, all of those things, especially the field of vascular biology is a field of vascular inflammation. Angiotensin II is not just a hormone that is made in response to blood pressure. It is a big cause of, of atherosclerosis because high blood pressure changes what's called endothelial dysfunction. And there's a lot of research looking at high blood pressure as a measure of endothelial dysfunction. So if you look at the example that I talked about in the beginning w at the talk, by restoring magnesium, you're restoring the integrity of the endothelium. You do that, you can help blood, blood pressure, you also lower the inflammatory response. Why does the DASH diet work? Dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It's fruits and vegetables. It's more than just a low salt diet. It's the antioxidants that are in the pigments of the fruits that you're eating that also have a beneficial effect. So as we talked about, hypertension and diabetes are states of, ox of oxidation, inflammation, and oxidative stress. And we have to be concerned not only with chronic kidney disease, but all, all the organs that are affected, especially not only the kidney, but the heart. Because as we talked about, the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among those with chronic kidney disease is heart-related. So a, again, just to review, and if, I, if I'm repetitively redundant, I apologize. I tend to kind of say the same thing a little bit here. But every, if we stop looking at kidneys as being separate from the body, but looking at it as everything in the body being connected, things start to make sense. There's a heart-kidney connection. There's something out there that's called the cardiorenal syndrome. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. And what that means is if you have advanced kidney disease and you have heart problems, the kidney disease can make the heart problems worse and the heart problems can make the kidney disease worse. And they look for all kinds of connections. And we see this a lot in the hospital. If you go to any floor where people are hospitalized for congestive heart failure and they have stage three or stage four chronic kidney disease, it becomes a vicious, never-ending cycle. You try to do something to help the heart, the kidneys are infected. You try to do something to help the kidneys, the heart's affected. And it just drives you, and I believe that the basis of this is an inflammatory response which drives each other, you know? And it's hard to know which comes first, the chicken or the egg? What's affected first, the heart or the kidney? And the truth is, you know, uh, Claudio Wanka, who did the initial studies out in Italy, is not really sure. But at least for me, if you can decrease the inflammatory response it helps this. The intestine and kidney, I believe everyone should be on a probiotic. Again, there's a kidney-specific probiotic uh, that I use that we'll talk about that, I've, that has been effective for uh, patients that I see in the office, but it's one part of the puzzle. There's also liver-kidney connecting. We'll talk about certain things that I've used with concrete examples, so it's not just something theoretical that I'm talking about, but patient examples that I've used. Um, when you talk about developing a kidney program for someone, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be followed by a qualified health professional. There's a lot of people out there that call themselves medical providers. What are their qualifications? What is it that they've used? What is their training? And I believe that a holistic approach, an integrated approach is key. Because if the mind isn't there, if the body isn't there, and if the spirit if it's not working together, no matter how many medications you're going to be on, you're not going to get better because the body is a unit, the body works in harmony together. It's like an orchestra. You know, if the, if the one part isn't working, nothing else is gonna work. So if we look at diet, D is diet, not just a way of losing weight, but a way of, a way of living, okay? Diet is probably the most important f medicine. Food is medicine. So diet should do the following. One, it should correct pro-oxidant deficiencies which we'll talk about. It should correct nutrient deficiencies. It should be anti-inflammatory in nature. Many of us are low in omega-3s. Omega-3 fish oil is a strong antioxidant. And if you look at the Western diet that many of us eat, we're low in omega-3 fish oil. Fruits and vegetables, you know, broccoli. Broccoli, if you were to go on, there's a website that's called nutritiondata.com. And this is a great site because if you look at that, it tells you everything you want to know about anything that you put in your mouth. The first is it'll tell you potassium content, it'll tell you phosphorus content, but it'll also tell you the anti-inflammatory power of what you're eating. It also tells you 
uh, the, uh, the glucose index to let you know, you know, how strong it is, the glycemic index. So broccoli has something in it called sephorophane. And it, has, it is one of the strongest antioxidants. It's moderate in terms of potassium because if you have a half cup of broccoli, it has about 200 to 225 mil, 150 to 200 mil, uh, milligrams of potassium. And that's as if someone is on a two to three gram potassium restricted diet. If you're eating that, you're getting anti antioxidant benefits. You're getting, it's also great anti-cancer, a great anti-cancer food. So, you know, if you juice in the morning, juicing is fantastic. You take something in the morning like baby carrots and apple, apple with pectin, which is anti-inflammatory, add a cucumber, add broccoli. You know, you, you're starting out in the morning, you get raw enzymes from the juice. You, you, it's a moderate potassium, and you can make the fruits and the vegetables that you add to this low on the glycemic index, moderate potassium, and phosphorus as well. But you need a guide, and I do like that website. But I, as part of, of something to do every morning that you can do to get the antioxidant effect and the anti-inflammatory effect, fruits and vegetables, but, you know, we say that, it's like, how can I do this concretely? Juicing is a great way. If you're on a fluid restriction, a six to eight ounce glass every morning, if you're, if you're restricted to 1,500 mils a day, you're getting all the antioxidants effects, and, and, and it's actually going to help you a lot more than some of the medications you may be taking, and you'll feel better. There are different dietary examples of things that have been around or things that you can adopt. One is the DASH diet that we talked about. And again, its benefits are far more than just a low sodium diet. It has, uh, the antioxidants are, are actually are really good. The eubiotic diet is actually something that's been proposed by naturopaths. And the eubiotic diet is actually, the, it goes, and again, I do believe this, that the center of your immune system, one of the centers of the inflammation in the body is the intestine. And the intestine is, you know, for example, um, there are different forms of nephritis. So when I talked about like hy hypertension and diabetes being low level inflammatory syndromes, things like the front nephritis, IG nephropathy, and lupus nephritis are high level inflammatory syndromes. And the, one of the keys, there's been, th when we talk about like an intestine kidney connection, certainly we know that in one out of every hundred uh, individuals has celiac disease. And there's a connection between celiac disease and IG nephropathy. But a person can have gluten hypersensitivity, not have celiac disease, and be at higher risk for IG nephropathy. When I trained a few years ago, the treatment for IG nephropathy was giving them prednisone or giving them immunosuppressive medication called Celsept or mycophenolate. Part of the treatment now, if we're talking about in a negative way, is number one, a gluten-free diet. Because they saw that these, the, those who had this certain condition had a significant hypersensitivity to gluten. In addition, testing for food sensitivities, because sensi things that we have food sensitivities, uh, you know, not food allergies, like uh, if you eat something, like you break out, like if you eat peanuts or something like that, but food sensitivities in that something that triggers an inflammatory reaction in the body uh, that also causes uh, an immune reaction within the kidney. And there's more of a link to that. Think about all the things that are processed within our food growth hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, and all those things that we have a reaction to. Everyone's makeup is different. So when I'm seeing somebody, when I'm talking about an integrative approach, as someone has nephritis, in children who would have something called minimal change disease, right? That's something that's the most common cause of proteinuria in children who are, you know, 10 and under. And they have nephrotic range proteinuria, meaning three grams or more. Before the treatment used to be steroids. And again, it's still standard of care, but Many of these children may just have antibodies to milk protein or the casein, it's in the milk protein. So by eliminating that and by doing the elimination diet and following more of an anti-inflammatory diet, they were able to find out the cause of what was causing some of these children to have proteinuria or protein in the urine, which we know is the most common risk factor for chronic kidney disease. So, um, you know, consequently, it's, it's more than just, you know, the diet is important not only because of the fruits and vegetables and antioxidants, but, see, I have the big mouth, I'm sorry. But also because of the inflammation that it can, and other, and other. And this is what I mean by an intestine kidney connection. Right. Testing, testing, okay. Does that make sense? You know, so the diet plays a role because, again, it's linked to somebody, lupus, right? There are some people that, in terms of, you know, what I've always done in the practice is, okay, rather than, like, for this lady, I said, what was, what's going on with this lady? This lady had celiac disease. 
Now, now some of you are thinking, what in God's name is the connection between celiac disease and lupus nephritis? It's a stimulation of the immune system. Maybe it's the cause. You know, maybe it w in her, we corrected the celiac disease. So in addition, when we talk about with the intestine, what I do, so uh, going back for a second, the person I had with IG nephropathy, gluten-free diet, I did a food sensitivities. I'm always, fi I'm finding food, sensi se bleh, food sensitivities in people. The third thing is a probiotic. If a person has stage three or stage four chronic kidney disease, I'm putting them on a Kibo probiotic. I've used it in patients. Why? Because you're getting rid of some of your toxins, which even in stage three chronic kidney disease, you can start. If they don't have stage three, I, I may use another probiotic. But if they have CKD, I want them on the right one. I'm also looking at their diet. And this is where this plays a role, and this is why it's so important. High blood pressure dash diet. If they, if they have diabetes, vegetarian diets have been shown to be more uh, efficacious than, you know, some of the other diets that are out there. But again, it's a dietary change. I recommend juicing. Again, but you can see where I'm going with this. You're getting antioxidants. You're getting anti-inflammatories. You're getting what you're needing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg because now we're going to talk about some of the supplements. But again, the diet needs to be personalized. I have a couple of patients in my practice who swear by a blood type diet that depending upon your blood type, it stimulates immune reaction. So if a person's type B or type A or type O, you know, in terms of the difference, in terms of that stimulating immune reaction, they feel better. You know, the science of that was done by Dr. Peter Adamo. And, and again, everyone is different, and everyone has different expectations, but, you know, the doctor, the nutrition is so important because, again, food is the best medicine before we talk about any other supplements. Ella's lifestyle. What is the quality and quantity of your sleep? Okay? For, if you have high blood pressure, one of the most under-diagnosed uh, causes of high blood, excuse me, of high blood pressure is sleep apnea. And everyone that I have sent for it, and it can, you know, it's more than just uh, when I go to sleep at night, I stop breathing, or when I get, I snore. Um, if you have, if you're obese, if you have the BMI greater than 30, uh, and you're having problems with high blood pressure, um, you know, everyone that I have sent, and I don't, there's nowhere in my life that I bat a thousand, honestly, you know. But when I've sent about nine out of ten people have had sleep apnea enough that until they were able to go in a program of losing weight and exercise and other things like that, being on CPAP, is it, is it the most comfortable thing out there? No. But by being on it, they at least were able to get a better night's sleep. If you don't get a good night's sleep, you know, ten years ago we used to get eight, hour, eight hours of sleep. Now we do seven. Now we're lucky if we do five, six a night. If when I'm on call, I don't get any sleep because the, you know, it's like Chinese water torture. To every hour the beeper just keeps going off. So we've lost those basic things that we used to do, the nutrition that we put in our bodies and, and, and sleep. And also, you know, sleep apnea, but also so the quantity and quality of the sleep is important. Stress. A person who's stressed, if you were to check something called endothelian levels, a person who has, who, again, I, I think all of us, we have stress in our lives, but it's how we cope and how we deal with it. Stress can actually increase endothelium. If we talked about high blood pressure, we talked about that area, that vascular biology that we were talking about. Stress levels raise endothelium. Endothelium at the cellular level is a vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstrictors raise blood pressure. So uh, breathing, I had someone who came in the office, their blood pressure was 190 over 100. Their primary doc wanted to send them to the emergency room. This woman was visibly upset. Had just gotten divorced. Her, her, you know, was with children, was just worried about everything. Um, and again, many of us struggle in this economy to, to, you know, just to try to deal with things on a daily, you know, uh, all of us are feeling the effects of the economy. Um, I had her do some breathing exercises. I had her deep in, uh, take a deep breath in, hold it for five seconds, breathe out. I shut the door, shut the light, and I just had her do that. I took her blood pressure. Ten minutes later, she was 140 over 86. Again. Still not, a, but breathing is so important. You know, we force ourselves every day in a fight or flight reaction. Okay, we get stressed out, we get pissed off, we get angry. Pardon my language. But before you go to bed, if you were even in the middle of the day, you take the time out. You, take, you teach yourself, and if you're a medical professional, you teach your patients how to breathe. We don't breathe correctly. You know, you take a deep breath in. You breathe with your inner key. You breathe with your diaphragm. You hold it. And then when you exhale, you do it for four to five seconds slowly. By the third breath, you will feel the tension leave your body if you do it the right way. And you picture the tension. That's what meditation is. That's what they do in martial arts. That's what, but that's all part of the whole package. 
because you decrease the stress level. You're getting better sleep. We're changing our eating patterns. We're changing what we're doing. Let's talk about drinking water because I know this is something that comes up. There was an article that came out. By the way, we have plenty of time. There was an article that, that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003 that talked about chronic low-level lead exposure as a cause of chronic kidney disease. You would think that if something came out in the New England Journal of Medicine that says that not just, not, we're, we're not talking about you know, painters or construction workers or people who worked and got acute lead toxicity, or like lead toxicity, like you know, we're talking about kids who eat pain or chew pain, or we're talking chronic low-level exposure that all of us are exposed to, was felt to be a leading risk factor for chronic kidney disease. And it didn't make the brouhaha that we all expected. But what happens? Mercury, lead, it deposits in the kidney. It is an underappreciated and unrecognized cause of chronic kidney disease. So part of what I do when I see somebody in the office, you know, if they're living in an old house, if you measure a lead level in someone who's been in an old house, it's going to be normal because the lead's in the tissues. It's not in the blood. You know, sometimes if you do a heavy metal screen and the doctor checks a 24-hour urine. So then the question is, what do you do? And I do some oral chelation, not intravenous, and that, that, that's something we'll talk about. But I have some oral chelation therapy of things that I do with antioxidants. Why? Because I want to get the lead out of the kidneys. I do a show, and some of you may have heard me babbling on yesterday, called Improve Your Kidney Health. The first guest that I ever had on that show w was, it was called Megan's Story. And there's a gentleman, he lives in Chicago, and he owns a health food store. It's, his name is uh, Brannigan, Brannigan's Store, Brannigan's. He has a 16-year-old daughter named Megan, and she has a type of nephritis called MPGN, or Membranoproliferative Glomerular Nephritis. And there's different types of it, and the type, second type is more severe than the first type. But she was on dialysis, and uh, you know he's, he's a nephrologist, and he's a is a little bit more holistic-minded. And he said he did just didn't he couldn't accept that. He said she's 16 years old. He did not want her to be on dialysis. So he looked for ways and reasons as to why, wh you know, what was the cause of this MPGN? Because, you know, as a, as a nephrologist, I mean, w in a young person, MPGN is is it's very hard to reverse, you know. And most of the people that, that, I ha that I've had who've been on it um, have, you know, they have the advanced form and it, the kidneys are scarred and there's a little reversibility. He did three things. Number one, he took the casein out of her diet. He put her on a gluten-free diet. So uh, the casein in the milk. So he put her on a dairy-free, milk-free diet. He added a probiotic. He added the kidney probiotic. And he got the braces out of her mouth. The braces were metal. They had mercury. As soon as he did that, the inflammatory response decreased, and she's been off dialysis. Now, he also has her, I have the show, and I encourage you to listen to the show. These are concrete examples. I'm not making any of this up, okay? When I heard that, I was blown away. Because of my training, I've never heard that before. He, it was someone who actually got off of dialysis, who had something like this in nephritis. It blew me away, and he told me a story. And other stories like that of meeting remarkable people are one of the reasons that I, that I started to do the kidney show that I was talking about. Um, I lost my train of thought. So in addition, but he had on an antioxidant supplement, and we'll talk about that as I go. But I mean, there are so many stories. I had on a, uh, a dietitian who used a vegetarian approach to uh, with kidney disease. And uh, her name is Joan Brooke Kaiser Hogan, and she had a book called The Vegetarian Approach to Chronic Kidney Disease. And she has studies in there by adopting more of that type of diet. She was able to improve GFRs by one stage. If you were stage four, you went to stage three. If you were stage three, if you went to stage two. Part of that also involved the use of a probiotic. Again, more of a kidney specific probiotic that I've talked about. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Her, na her name is Joan Hogan, H-O-G-A-N. Um, if you go on my website, it's improveyourkidneyhealth.com, and I have all her links, including her. So with, with the water, the first thing is you should be drinking filtered water. I am a big believer in alkalinized water. And again, I know I, that kind of turns some heads when I talk about it, but let me explain why. We do know that especially in chronic kidney disease, you can have a problem with acidosis. So not only can acidosis worsen chronic kidney disease, but it can have an adverse effect on bone health. The second thing is, I don't know about you, but I, I've prescribed bisutra for patients. Have you ever tasted it? It's kind of nasty. Sodium bicarbonate tabs, if you think about, let's say a person has stage four chronic kidney disease, they have advanced, and their bicarbonate levels are running 15, 16. 
one sodium tablet is 650 milliequivalents. Now, you have to understand our bodies every day, if we eat an animal protein diet, we're increasing the acid generation in our body. So the amount of acid that we generate each day is, you know, our, our weight in grams. So if a person weighs, like, say, 150 pounds, which is 70 grams, that's 70 milliequivalents a day. If you're taking a sodium bicarbonate pill, maybe you're, you're buffering about three to four milliequivalents. So you've got to take a lot of sodium bicarb. So number one, we know we're all on sodium restrict. We have to watch the amount of sodium we take in. Second of all, a lot of the times we underdose the amount of bicarbonate we're giving people because they don't tolerate it. They don't tolerate sodium bicarb. They don't tolerate citrate. Again, although I, I'm all for alkaline. So there was a couple of studies looking at that alkalinized water in animals helped replace the, meta, you know, the, the acid levels. So there's a, uh, you know, if you can add lemon to water, that's one good way. The other way is I believe there's a kind of a water system that alkalinizes. I use something called the Sanitia water system. Again, it's just something that I've had that it actually was brought to me by a patient, but it's a whole comprehensive system. But it beats buying filters or bottled water, and then you have to worry if you use, uh, you know, water with BPA that's in the plastic bottles. If you add lemon, even though it's acidic in the body, it gets, it's more of an alkali. Like lemon is actually used for kidney stones because it alkalizes water because lemon gets converted to citric acid or citrate. So, you know, I do think that it, you should have, your water should be filtered or you should have a filtered water British or something because of the toxins and things that are in our water. I don't know about you, but I live in eastern Pennsylvania and the quality of the water is bad. If you ever get the water report and you look at it, you just want to scream. The nearby city in the past five years had to have their water system shut off for, for a while because of, of impuri the, the impurities and things like that in the water. But this is the basis in terms of chronic kidney disease you have to begin to talk about. That's a great thing. You know, uh, you try to get your, your uh, and again, th there's different, uh, people disagree on this, but you know, the normal uh, uh, water usually has a pH of seven to seven and a half. Some people, depending upon where they are, they, it's around seven and a half to, to, to eight. I try to get it from nine to 11, that's my goal. So some people add pH drops, but you have to watch about the pH drops because they contain potassium. So you have to watch about the different pH drops you use. That's why I like more of an alkalized water system. And if you think about, um, certain ones that, like, if you use a more, more mineralized water system, uh, you know, distilled water you have to watch because distilled water can leach bone, can leach minerals from bone. If you have renal osteodystrophy, chronic kidney disease, that's already a problem that you're dealing with. Um, let, I want to come, I want, there's a couple, I want to finish more with the lecture than I, I promise we'll have time to do the questions. I, um, so again, uh, we live in a toxic environment, our water, our air, our soil. Heavy metals are an unrecognized cause of chronic kidney disease, and we need to do something to get them out of our system. Um, exposure to pesticides, you know, spraying crops, stuff that they're putting, I mean, that has to have an effect on us. How can it not? It's not something that's talked about, but, you know, are the problems that we have as a result of the environment that we're living in, you know? And again, it's just something you have to kind of be aware of, the water you're drinking, the food you're putting in your mouth, the environment around you, the air, the water, the soil. Let's talk about some specifics. A is antioxidant and anti-inflammation. So just going back to what we talked about in the beginning of the lecture, decreasing the level of inflammation in the body can be natural. And this has been shown in shorter studies. If we talk, look at that bardoxolone to increase GFR, decrease blood urea nitrogen, serum phosphorus, serum uric acid, and increase creatinine clearance. One aspect of this, and again, there's other things because of the comprehensive program. One is a kidney-based probiotic. And why does this work? You have toxins that accumulate in the intestine, even in stage three chronic kidney disease. Let me give you a couple concrete examples of this. Um, I had one show where I did, it was called the Heart Kidney Connection. And I'm, I'm gonna get the names of the people because they were on the air, so I'm not in any way giving away HIPAA. And his name is Robert and Mary Nelson. We talked about the Heart Kidney Connection. We talked about cardiorenal syndrome. He is a 75-year-old gentleman who has a baseline creatinine of about 1.6. And he came over, he moved from Indiana over to the state of Pennsylvania. And he was in and out of the hospital with flash pulmonary edema. And at that time, he also suffered from gout. And, you know, he would, there were so many things he tried. He tried colchicine, he tried allopurinol. Colchicine, you know, some people get diarrhea, they don't tolerate it. Allopurinol, he just didn't tolerate, he got nauseous. 
He had recurring problems with gout. He had problems with energy. He felt bad. He was in and out of the hospital with volume. So we, we'll talk about the diuretics in a second, but there are things that, that I did that I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I p ended up putting him on his probiotic. And in addition to just watching his purine intake and meat intake, this increased the uric acid secretion. He has not had any more problems with gout. It also normalizes bowel habits, which again, decreases the inflammation in the bowel. So you have multiple things. You have this one uh, probiotic, which is doing multiple things. Uric acid, when it's high, is linked to inflammation, impaired fasting glucose, which is you know, a precursor to diabetes, and also high blood pressure. So it has a lot of other things. So lowering uric acid is good. And if you could do it by natural means, it means one less medication that you're taking. He also had heart problems. And, you know, if you ever listen to a Dr. Stephen Sinatra, I have been using uh, his uh, cocktail for patients with heart disease, which means a combination of coenzyme Q10, co uh, carnitine, L-carnitine, and D-ribose. And this guy went from not even being able to walk 100 feet. He's sitting there doing weights with his wife, and his sex life is fantastic. Now, he's on uh, like 10,000 milligrams of ribose. He's taking carnitine at a low dose and coenzyme Q10. If you have diabetes, you're, you're deficient in coenzyme Q10. If you're on dialysis, you're deficient in ubiquitin or coenzyme Q10, and I supplement, and I've seen differences. We talk about intestine and the kidney, as I've talked about. Nephritis, different forms of nephritis may be related to f food sensitivities. The one uh, link between IgA nephropathy and gluten or celiac disease is just one of them. Yeast overgrowth. All of us, we've been on antibiotics. Maybe some of us have been on steroids. If you look at a holistic way of thinking about the, your immune system, your intestine is the center, okay? So not only is probiotics important, but if you can cure yeast overgrowth, um, again, we know that if you take antibiotics, we've seen it in the hospital, a person gets antibiotic after antibiotic, they get a yeast infection, right? Or if you take an antibiotic, well, that's going on all over your body, especially the intestine, because candida is a normal part of the intestine. And if you have bad flora that's there, or an antibiotic or something like that, you get overgrowth. So if you can decrease the amount of yeast against probiotics can help uh, with that, but I also certain yeast protocols. Remember when I talked to you about the olive leaf extract in the beginning of the lecture? It's also an antifungal. You dampen the immune response in the intestine, you, you dampen the, the inflammation. Our Western diet, again, also uh, low in omega-3s, as well as some of this other stuff, it also increases total body inflammation. Let, let's talk about some of the supplements a little bit. Let's talk about liver disease. So you know that liver, even in a compensated state, you know, it directly affects kidney function. Fatty liver is the most common cause. One out of every three people has a fatty liver. It's going to affect your kidney function. How can I talk about the kidney without talking about the liver? When I see people in a hospital who have advanced liver disease, the kidneys are the first things that are affected. And it gets very, very hard to... to help the kidneys when the liver shot. Alcohol and medications are, are certainly uh, other things that can affect liver. We know statins can cause problems with liver, liver tests and alcohol. Um, we talked about the cardiorenal syndrome and the fact that inflammation begets even more inflammation. So let's talk about supplements. Let's kind of get to the nitty gritty here. So the first thing is you talk with your doctor. And I have a pretty open relationship with my patients. It, it's professional, but, in, but, but personal. They all call me rich. You know, I think the only one who calls me the doctor is the, the my mother. I'm just kidding, my mother. Huh? But, um, you know, see, I keep my day job because my jokes are so bad. Um, so the first thing is coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 is a cofactor that's needed for energy to sell. It also, and again, there's studies out there, and it, I can... Anyone who emails me to improve your kidney health at gmail.com, I provide you links. I'm not in any way making any of this up. It helps with blood pressure. It helps normalize endothelial function. If you're on a statin or a beta blocker or an oral sulfonylureas medication like glipizide, amaryl, the first thing you need to do is you can be deficient in coenzyme Q10 because all those medications have a role with ubiquinol synthesis. If you take ubiquinol, it can also reduce uh, your, your insulin. It can also reduce blood sugars. So it has an effect if you have diabetes. It also can help lower blood, lower, lower blood pressure. I'll normally start, you know, and divided doses are better than taking it once a day. Because if you think about how your intestine absorbs things, it's not going to take one big dose and just absorb it throughout the day. If you take smaller doses throughout the day, you get more bang for your buck. 
especially with more of these natural supplements. So with coenzyme Q10, I'll start people at 50 twice a day, 100 twice a day. Acetyl-carnitine, I had a patient on dialysis. She was 78, and she didn't want to come to dialysis anymore because she had problems with cramps. And I, you know, her, her, uh, they looked at her dry weight, they looked at her blood pressure, her potassium is okay, her calcium and magnesium. I put her on L-carnitine, 500 milligrams with every treatment, and her, and, her, and her cramps got better. I had someone else, he's 80 years old, he has stage 4 chronic kidney disease, he had an injection fraction of 20%, which means he had uh, cardiomyopathy, his heart wasn't, wasn't working, he was talking about hospice. And I put him on coenzyme Q10 and carnitine. His cardiologist said he looked the best he had in years. You know, and again, normal doses, if you don't have any problems with your kidneys, is two to three grams. Now, those who are on dialysis may have, been, may have uh, been familiar with an intravenous form called Carnitor. This is a little bit different. This is more of an oral dose, and again, I start small. I have a lady on home dialysis who was so fatigued she didn't want to leave her house. She was tired, her quality of life sucked. She was a retired nurse, and she hated it because she knew what she used to be able to do. I put a little coenzyme Q10, a little carnitine, and something called D-ribose, which was in a powder, and she's just on a small dose. Um, and she's out, and she's walking around again, and she's uh, going to the mall. She's doing things. It also helped her because she was also inadvertently diagnosed with MS, at the, you know, with an exacerbation. That's helped her with that as well. So she's got a new release on quality of life, which she's never had before. Omega-3 fish oil. You know, if you read some books, they'll talk about for things like lupus and things like that, mega doses of omega-3 fish oil. But we're deficient of this in our diet. Omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So at the very least, especially if you have cardiac disease, at least a gram of omega-3 fish oil a day. If you're eating fish, you know, again, you want to watch the mercury and, and you know, if you're, if you're doing salmon, but you want to watch where you get the omega-3 fish oil from. Uh, you know, if you get the ones from the store, the... Uh, container, you know, the, the, the outer coating, you can, you can burp, you can belch. If you go to more of a natural food store, uh, you know, some other places, or Nordic Natural, something like that, you're going to get a better form where you're not going to get the stomach ups. I mean, this more, and, and the reason that's important is because even if you're taking a gram, you may not be absorbing it. You know what I mean? So, and if a person has an inflammatory condition, I may go three, four grams of omega-3 fish oil a day. You should take it with food and then kind of decrease down a little bit. Turmeric. Turmeric is a spice. You know, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's actually a pharmaceutical company trying to patent turmeric. I think this is crazy. You know, um, turmeric, how do I use turmeric? First of all, it's great for pain. Turmeric is great for pain. Um, the other thing is it's anti-inflammatory. I had someone in the office, creatinine was 1.4. And the, uh, she had about eight grams of, uh, eight, uh, 800 milligrams of protein, which is like tubular range. A normal protein level in urine should be about 200 milligrams. And, you know, I, she was on an ACE inhibitor. She was on lisinopril. So, we, again, I, I said it's integrated. So there's a standard of care. ACE inhibitors, they do a lot of things, help with blood pressure, relax the kidney, help with protein. I put on turmeric, 400 milligrams a day, plus another supplement, alpha-lipoic acid. And follow-up, she had 160 milligrams of protein in her protein-creatinine ratio. So just by doing that, she came down and we talked about different changes in her diet. Magnesium. And, again, certainly if you have chronic kidney disease, you need to watch the amount of magnesium that you take in, but many of us are low. And especially if we're not getting, you know, vegetables have magnesium in it. So I gave the example, you know, this, if you look at a, a magnesium really reflects the amount of, uh, it's more in the cell. So we measure a level in the blood, it doesn't completely tell us how much is in the cell, but at the same time it gives us an idea. So let's say a reference range is 1.6 to 2.2. Two. I get someone's magnesium back, it'll be 1.7. I increased the magnesium level. I'll use, a chel I'll use a chelated form of magnesium without the heavy metals. I don't want to give any more heavy metals than, than they're already taking, right? So if I increase it by 200, 400 milligrams a day, I'll get a follow-up magnesium level. I'll get their levels up to 2.1 to 2.2. I've had dramatic responses with blood pressure. I've been able to get them off some of their medications, which is then making them feel crappy. And isn't the most important thing quality of life? I mean, that's what we all want. We all want quality of life. And again, the above, it's anti-inflammatory. It's also great for the heart and the kidney. Let's talk about liver disease. Alpha-lipoic acid. Alpha-lipoic acid is an antioxidant. It's responsible for the regeneration of something called glutathione, which is the most potent antioxidant in the cell. It's, all, it's also an oral chelation agent, meaning that if you... Um, 
Uh, you know, have we talked about the heavy metals? I put people, I, I have someone on this. It's also great for neuropathy. So if you have diabetes and diabetic neuropathy, this is great. This works. There's no side effects with this medication. I have hundreds of people on this. It helps also helps lower blood sugar. It can also help with neuropathic pain. So you're having one substance, and it's also a great antioxidant. It also helps regenerate vitamin C and vitamin D in the, in the body. Common doses, a maximum is 900 milligrams a day. I'll start at 100 milligrams twice a day. It's also an oral chelation agent. Do you want a glass of water? Are you okay? Are you sure? I, I can, there's a glass up here if you want. Are you sure? Okay. Um, milk thistle. Milk thistle is great for... Milk thistle is great for... No, it's all good. It's all good. I hope you're okay. I hope you're okay. All right. It's those ducks. No. All right. <laughs> but milk thistle, 100 milligrams twice a day. It is great for liver detoxification. I, I do have people on it. I mean, don't you, you want to do something for yourself, and if your doctor says, I have a fatty liver, what can I do? Milk thistle is something. It's not going to interact with, 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 with much. Alpha-lipoic acid, both of them work together. Vitamin E at low doses, like 200 international units a day, I think also has a benefit. Um, there's some other studies looking at goji berry as something that can also help with, with, with a fatty liver, and also N-acetylcysteine, which, which is a natural antioxidant, right? N-acetylcysteine also gets regenerated glutathione. You're, and if you take acetaminophen, right, and you're taking that for pain, that depletes your cells of glutathione. So long-term, chronic use also sets you, sets you up for a liver problem, but also you know, analgesic nephropathy, it also puts you at risk long-term for kidney disease. Helping the intestine, we've talked about this. If you have chronic kidney disease, I had one gentleman, he's 85 years old. Can you say that again? Sorry. You got it. He's 85 years old. He had a creatinine of three and a half. He's about 150 pounds. And he just, a wife gave me a call. He's feeling tired, he's not feeling well. We had a long talk about dialysis. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. But at, at the same time, he wanted to try something. I put him on the probiotic. I put him on a keto probiotic. He's taking two at each meal. His creatinine was about 3.8. He's now down to 2.5. He feels better. He's also on Procrit, so he get his blood count up. But there's a difference in how he is and how he's feeling, and uh, he's not having uremic symptoms anymore. So we've been able to promote his quality of life and at the same time, you know, do something that decreases the inflammatory response, clears uric acid. I, I just like the idea of it. Antifungal treatment, candida overgrowth. Olive leaf extract, which I've talked about for blood pressure, or oil of oregano. It's an antioxidant. There was a study that came out in Italy. They use olive leaf extract for blood pressure all the time. There was a study that came out that looked at captopril, which is an, an ACE inhibitor, and looked at olive leaf extract and looked at their ability to lower blood pressure. When I've had people whose blood pressure I can't get down, I'm looking at magnesium, I'm looking at CoQ10, I'm looking at garlic extract, aged garlic extract. I've had really good results with this stuff. Again, it's, it's, it's working it together with the medications and trying to get, because some of the medications people feel bad with. But all of us know those are on four or five medications. If you're on four or five medications and you're adding more, all you're getting is side effects. I'm not saying that medications aren't good. I'm saying that sometimes you have to think outside the box. All I've ever tried to do in my practice was ask a different question. What can we do different? Why is this happening? What can we do to think outside the box to try to improve things? Because as you add more medications, all you're getting is more potential drug interactions. Do you really need to be on the proton pump inhibitor? You know, if I, I'm not going to do radio, but if I would ask how many people on Prilosec or some medication to that, you know, that was never meant for us to be on it long term. And, and the reason that I, that I say that is, you know, if you've had gastritis or you have an ulcer, the usual time period is about six to eight weeks. But if you're on it, I would ask your doctor, do you really need to be on that medication? A couple reasons. Number one, it changes your gastric pH. Your pH in your, in your stomach is normally supposed to be acidic. That's how you digest food. If you eat a piece of meat and you're taking a proton pump inhibitor, you're not able to really get that B12 from that meat. So you're on the risk of B12 deficiency. You also run, you know, the other question is risks of things like cl Clostridium difficile and really bad colitis, especially if you're in the hospital. It's one of the reasons because we're altering our intestinal pH. Does that set up, you know, uh, uh, set the flora up in our, in our stomach or different to, to increase the risk of obtaining this? And if you don't know, C. diff colitis is one of the most, uh, it's the most common cause of hospital-acquired infection. And it can be fatal. I know because I see a lot of it working in the hospital. 
The third thing is it can impact bone disease. If we have kidney disease, right, we know that, you know, we care about our bones. We care about our bone health. And, you know, if you're malabsorbing vitamin D because you have an alkaline pH, you know, it does affect intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus and vitamin D. So, uh, you know, if anything, it increases the risk of bone disease, osteoporosis, B12 deficiency. So the question is, if you need to be on it, that's fine. You need to be on it. But ask your doctor, can I be switched to something else? And again, bone disease is important, phosphorus control. We all know that. But there's, you know, for many people, if we're vitamin D deficient, you should be on vitamin D to try to help. Vitamin D does a lot with modulating the immune system. But I want to throw out a couple things else at you. One is vi something called vitamin K2. If you're on Coumadin, you can't take this, okay? But vitamin K2, what it does, it takes the calcium from your blood and puts it back in your bones. And if you're going to buy it, you want something called an NK7 form. So you just don't want to sit, you know, the question is always, do I need calcium, do I need vitamin D? It's more of a complete package to try to get your bones better, but also looking at total body health. So yes, do I use Zemplar or a, an activated vitamin D form? Absolutely. If a person's on dialysis, are they getting Sensipar if they need because of hyperparathyroid bone disease? Yes. Am I using a phosphorus binder? Yes. Are they on regular vitamin D3? If their levels are low and I, I try to aim for uh, levels of about 40? Yes. Um, but I'm also watching your calcium because there's studies that too high a calcium, too low a calcium does, you know, increase your morbidity and mortality. So there's a lot that we're watching. But I want to do other things too. Vitamin C helps the interaction with phosphorus. It also helps vitamin D go from an inactivated form to, a vi to, to an activated form. Maybe you don't need as much of the, um, maybe you don't need as much of the Zemplar or the, um, the Zemplar or the, or the Calcijex. Vitamin K2, I have it for everybody because I think it also helps with decreased risk of peripheral vascular disease, which we have designed, that's one thing. The other thing is magnesium. You know, the, the calcium intake in and of itself isn't as important as the ratio of the calcium and magnesium. Just like for high blood pressure, it's not just sodium. It's the relationship of sodium and potassium in your diet. Certainly, if you have chronic kidney disease, you have to watch the amount of potassium and magnesium you put in. It doesn't mean you don't take any, and depending upon your diet, you may need more magnesium supplementation. But again, it's blood work that you have to get. Um, I do a show called Improve Your Kidney Health on VoiceAmerica.com, and again, you can see the approach that I try to utilize, and it's try to looking at integrative and things that we can do, and there's other, other things that I didn't even talk about that, that, I, that I've been using, but, you know, if you're asking me what I use adjunctive for blood pressure in addition to the meditation, it's with the olive leaf extract, the aged collard garlic extract, uh, coenzyme Q10, more magnesium, more potassium, I'm sorry. You know, the, if you're certainly anything with vitamin K, so you have to watch the vegetables and the vitamin K. And, you know, if you're on Coumadin, you know, there are some studies out there, does Coumadin increase your risk of osteoporosis over time? I mean, that, that's a whole separate question. Um, but certainly, and is anything more with vitamin K? The one thing about Coumadin you have to watch is not so much uh, things you can't take, but things will alter the bowel flora because the bowel flora of vitamin K is synthesizing your intestine. Uh, and also medications that will interact with Coumadin, so things that are enzymatic inhibitors. So certain statins you have to watch. You also have to watch if you take iron. Iron can also affect. So you really have to look at every uh, one common, uh, if you have heart problems, is amiodarone and Coumadin. You know, amiodarone can increase Coumadin levels. So you really, any medication that you're taking, um, and certainly you talk about things like St. John's wort. Um, you know, if a person's depressed, uh, again, St. John's wort, you have to watch if it interacts with all the other medications. But a CME or S S is, um, is a good thing not only for liver detoxification but also for depression. It has a minimal reaction with other things. I've taken it myself. We all have those days. One other quick question just to add is can a person who's on a probiotic, can they take, can they take vitamin K? Um, it depends on the situation. Normally it's recommended not so because the, the probiotic can cause the, the flora to increase the synthesis of vitamin K. But you know what? I have people on it and, and – what I do is I say, look, I'm going to talk to your doctor. If I'm going to put you on a probiotic, I want to talk to him so that he knows that we need to, you know, all, you know, follow your INR levels. Because if there's something that can be on that's beneficial, I'd rather they do that. Just like it doesn't make any sense to not eat vegetables if you're going to be on Coumadin. You eat the vegetables, you adjust your Coumadin intake if you have to take it. All right, we have different questions. I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead. We have time for about one or two more questions. Okay, how do you feel about the Shoot. 
I know. You know, when I, this, you can argue, you know, when I talk about integrative medicine, you talk about things that are complementary. When I have different discussions with doctors, sometimes they kind of roll their eyeballs at me. When I talk about it with a patient, you know, most of the time when I'm doing stuff like this, I'm saying, you know, they've been on five or six medications, their blood pressure is just all high, and they still feel crappy. Um, there, I can tell you that, you know, there's things that I'm writing up that I'm sending out. Uh, I'm telling you that I have a lot of patients who are on this stuff. And again, it's a conversation. I talk about the pros and the cons, and I ask them to look some stuff up. I don't force anything on them. I look for potential drug interactions. And, you know, I, I work with the same amount of supplements over time, and you get a comfort level with them. But any time, you know, every patient comes in the office or that calls me, it's, an, it's a conversation that we're having about different things. But I like to think that there's an alternative. And if you talk about where, you know, where medicine is going, and we talk about, you know, the economy and, and, and everything that's going on and the debt, we owe it to ourselves to think of what we can do to prevent worsening kidney disease. But the treatment, but again, the treatment for kidney disease is going to be lowering inflammation and recognizing the connections with different aspects in the body. You know, so I, I hear what you're saying, but I think there needs to be a newer standard of care. All right, uh, you, you had your hand up for a while. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. No, you, yes, you, you're right there. Right. So the vitamin K2, you kind of have to watch a little bit with Plavix. Um, because of, of that, I wouldn't recommend taking if you're on Plavix. It, it's a questionable interaction because of the, you know, the, the fact that it can increase blood clotting. Although it's a different pathway, I, I've still been kind of saying that if you're on aspirin, I haven't had a problem with, but with Plavix, I've been kind of careful. Yes, ma'am. You know, if, yeah, you should talk with your doctor. You know, if anyone's interested, you know, I do have this in the, in the book. I, I am some slings on the books, 25% for the American Kidney Fund. So a lot of this information is in there as well. I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, what, ma'am? Uh, the $10, special price here for $10. And again, 25% is going to American Kidney Fund. All right, what, what, she have one more. You know, you, you want the purest grade possible. You know, I, before I would even start this, I went to all the different health food stores in my area and I looked. Good places in terms of online is vitacost.com. Puritan Pride is pretty good to get some of the nutraceuticals. If you go to a place like, and again, I don't want to get sued by GNC, but some of the other places where if you go to your pharmacy, um, more the, fil the more fillers they use, the less pure it is. The other thing I would, I would also say is, you know, a vitamin, if you're taking is like a Centrum 1 or something like that, is a synthetic vitamin, meaning your body has to work harder to digest it, you know. So more of a natural thing. So you need to know the stores and the purity of the product that you're getting. But if you email me, I can, I can get you that information. But vitacost.com and Puritan Pride is actually pretty good. It's improveyourkidneyhealth.com. Improve and it'll let you show. Fascinating and 